everyone. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm Spencer. I'm a PhD candidate in Lawrence Packer's lab. Uh, happy to be here to talk about um, not bees. So I'm happy to be that guy who shows up to the bee conference to talk about sawflies. Uh, I'll just get this started here. Um, but I'm going to be talking specifically about some collections-based phylogenomics work that I'm working on now. Uh, that should, I think, hopefully be interesting to any of the, those of you who are interested in phylogenetics in general, uh, so that you can, uh, you know, apply these ideas to your own favorite um, vegetarian wasps, which I presume are bees. So sawflies, of course, are the non-stinging relatives of bees, wasps, and ants. So instead of a needle-like ovipositor or sting, they have a saw-like ovipositor that they use to cut slits into plant tissues where they lay their eggs. So here's a columbine leaf showing a couple of slits on the leaf margins uh, that form a little pocket where the egg is inserted. Uh, and those eggs hatch most of the time into these green caterpillar-like creatures, uh, not too dissimilar from moths and butterflies. Uh, and most of them feed externally on plant leaves. So sawflies uh, do share a number of similarities with bees. Um, adults do, uh, do visit uh, flowers for pollen and nectar. Usually it's the same flowers of the plants that they fed on as larvae. Uh, so they are occasionally pollinators. Um, they also have a similar species diversity in Canada, so probably about 800 species for sawflies, about 950 bees, uh, give or take in either case. Uh, being that they're both hymenopterans, uh, they are uh, therefore both um, haplodiploid, uh, and this has a consequence that uh, some of the time CO1 barcodes, uh, mitochondrial DNA, don't work so well. It can be misleading. This problem is a lot more widespread with sawflies. Uh, in bees, it's really mostly just an issue for uh, recent radiations of closely related species. A great example is lazy glossum. Uh, they are dependent, of course, on their host plants, uh, both bees and sawflies alike. Uh, this has impacts on their phenology and distribution. Uh, with the result that uh, many widespread species, some of which might even be considered common, can be quite infrequently sampled. So I'm sure many of you can relate to the experience of going to a specific place at a specific time of year looking for a specific uh, animal and not finding it at all. That can be very frustrating, so uh, I can relate to this as I've found this to be the case both for bees and sawflies at this point. Uh, there are some differences, of course. Uh, so sawflies are free-living larvae. They feed externally on host plant tissues, whereas uh, larval bees have their cozy little homes inside of nest cells, uh, feeding on uh, pollen provisions. So as a result of that, bee adults tend to be uh, longer lived, because, or at least females are, uh, because they're spending that time collecting pollen to provision their nests, whereas sawfly adults are, they're only alive for a few days, usually maybe a week. Uh, just long enough to mate and lay their eggs. Most notably, at least uh, in my opinion, uh, is their diversity patterns. So globally speaking, sawflies are more diverse in cool, moist regions, uh, particularly in the northern hemisphere, whoops, uh, whereas bees are more diverse in hot and dry regions. So in fact, that, uh, that pattern uh, in sawflies uh, is one of the reasons that I initially started studying sawflies. Uh, so they have their highest species uh, diversity at uh, higher latitudes, northern temperate, kind of subarctic, arctic regions of the northern hemisphere, in uh, contrast to most other living groups, which tend to be more diverse towards the equator. Uh, so I'm interested in exploring this. As far as I can tell, the best way to do it is using molecular sequence data. Now, as I just mentioned, most of the specimens that I come across were already collected a good amount of time ago. So they, they tend to be kind of lower quality DNA uh, sitting in uh, collection drawers in cabinets in museums. Uh, so the problem, the issue is really this. Uh, so most of the information we have about most of these things uh, in terms of taxonomic and phonistic information, that is to say distributions, phonologies, and eco ecological information, that information accrues over time in the form of museum specimens, uh, slowly and gradually, not the result of, you know, one or two expeditions to collect fresh material. So uh, many, maybe even most species, uh, wind up being known only from preserved specimens uh, with relatively degraded DNA, which is a, a, an obstacle for molecular research. Uh, but new methods more and more are making it possible to recover genomic data uh, from such specimens, uh, many of which, in many cases, even very old specimens with quite degraded DNA. 
So there are kind of two categories for approaches uh, to, to museum phylogenomics, so to speak. The first one is shotgun sequencing. Uh, so this approach essentially involves uh, sequencing short random sequence of the genome uh, and uh, assembling those into contigs, mac them onto a reference genome. Uh, and then you can use that sort of patchy genome to do whatever you like. Uh, it's a very malleable approach. You can apply it to essentially anything that has DNA and you can use those patchy genomes to uh, ask questions about um, various uh, scales of diversity. So the real promise is that you can get really, really well-resolved phylogenies just by making serial analyses at finer and finer scales, uh, evolutionarily speaking. It's a little bit expensive. Uh, you need high sequencing effort to uh, get good depth on those, uh, on those reads. Um, and it is more analytically intensive than some, other, some of these other approaches. Uh, and, uh, the reason being you have to kind of tailor your analytical approach to uh, the, the, the analyses that you want to do. So it's a little bit more costly, a little bit more time consuming, but uh, very powerful. Uh, the reference I cite here uh, uses this to look at uh, phylogenomics in uh, swallowtail butterflies. It's a very cool paper. The other category uh, is uh, target enrichment. Uh, so with these approaches, you have probes that you uh, are targeting specific DNA sequences with and then enriching, enriching those sequences from even quite degraded material. Uh, both of these categories of uh, techniques work on degraded specimens. Target enrichment tends to work a little bit better, particularly uh, UCEs. So uh, common examples are anchored hybrid, hybrid enrichment, uh, which typically targets specific, non, or, or, sorry, specific protein coding genes of interest uh, and UCEs. These approaches are a little bit cheaper compared to shotgun sequencing, although the data sets may be a little bit more limited in scope. The upshot to that is uh, the analysis is also a little bit easier. So for deeper evolutionary scales uh, in Hymenoptera, the clear choice uh, is UCEs. Uh, this, this is a very popular approach to uh, phylogenomics in Hymenoptera and for good reason. We have a standard user, universal set of probes that works across a, a wide range of taxa. Uh, you get these highly conserved regions from across the genome. Uh, there is a, a very nice analysis pipeline that is uh, well documented and widely used called Phylus. Uh, so it's, it's kind of easy mode, I guess, if you want to look at it that way. Won't talk too much about UCEs, although I am interested in using them in the future. Um, there's also going to be, uh, I'm told, a departmental seminar in February given by Silas Bossert, uh, where he will be talking about this method. So if you're interested in that, stay tuned. Um, I'm more interested at the moment, at least, about very recent divergences. So I'm looking at these cool adapted species that are found uh, broadly across North America, and I'm wondering, you know, how do they get to be uh, where they are today? Uh, so to, so uh, to, to get that kind of fine scale information, I'm using an approach called HIRAD. So this is essentially a target enrichment approach. Uh, but in this case, the probes are designed to capture uh, RADseq markers. Uh, so these are fragments of DNA associated with restriction enzyme binding sites. Uh, RADseq data is uh, very popular for like, population level stuff, phylogeography uh, uh, work, um, but you can't really get it from degraded DNA. So this, this uh, probe-based approach, uh, this target enrichment approach, combines the best of both worlds. You can uh, work with uh, older material uh, and you can get this fine scale evolutionary data. So I'm using this approach to look at the phylogeography of three uh, widespread species, Pristophora syncta, Borea, and Sycophanta. And I'm interested in looking at uh, how these species have uh, moved around North America. Uh, two of them are also found in Eurasia. So there's uh, probable you know, uh, use of the Bering Land Bridge at some point in the past. I also wanna look at glacial refugia, roots of post-glacial recolonization, as I mentioned. Uh, and I can also look at continental scale patterns of genetic diversity while using these uh, RADSIG, RADSIG data sets. You can also look at evidence of cryptic species, and I'm gonna talk about that. Just gonna show you some, uh, a map here of uh, the candidate specimens that I have databased of Pristophora syncta to start with. So this is 969 specimens, uh, kind of similar to a map that Evan showed you this morning. Um, I, I, except in this case, I haven't accounted for, accounted for sample size. So what you see at each point uh, the color corresponds to the most recently collected specimen. So at most of these localities, the most recent specimens are from the 40s and 50s and 60s. So you can see why uh, this necessitates some kind of 
uh, you know, museum phylogenomics approach. Uh, relatively few of them and from restricted ranges are more recently collected. The idea is to sample a handful of individuals from different parts of the range to kind of represent the total distribution. And then I can sort of lump these together to represent huge chunks of range uh, to, to then kind of test phylogenetic hypotheses about uh, how they got to be where they are today from where they were in the past. So one such example uh, might be, you know, maybe they all came from a single refugium, maybe Beringia up in uh, Alaska and Northeastern Eurasia. Uh, and perhaps that's the result of a single incursion into North America. So uh, hypothetically, if that were the case, you might accept, expect to see uh, the phylogeny to look, uh, look, come out looking something like this, uh, where all of the North American populations come together in a single clade, Eurasian ones are off on their own, and you've got this kind of west to east uh, this pattern of uh, divergence. Uh, one other possible scenario might be two separate incursions into North America. So I actually have some evidence from Kowan barcodes that uh, this, this seems to have happened in this species. Uh, so, you know, maybe there was an earlier incursion and uh, that those populations sheltered in a different refugium uh, than the ones that more recently sheltered in Beringia. Who knows, right? This is, these are just two alternative hypotheses of a good number of hypotheses that I intend to test. Uh, so this is just to give you an idea of uh, what this approach will be used for in my case. Uh, yeah, and I'm also gonna be looking at some kind of traditional, more traditional population genetic stuff, or in this case, population genomics. Uh, this is just a dummy visualization to give you kind of a visual cue uh, to remind you of similar maps that you've seen. This is all a work in progress. Results are yet to come. Thanks very much, COVID-19. Um, so I'm, I'm working on this right now, uh, but hopefully the general approach is interesting to some or all of you. Uh, thanks so much for listening. Yeah, thanks, Spencer, and thanks again for going ahead.